Amen. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write down the title of this message. We're in Ezekiel chapter 8. And the title of this message is Dirty Little Secrets. You got one of those? Well, you, would, you wouldn't raise your hand if you had one, or else it wouldn't be a secret anymore, right? I want to share with you a story about my son, Brave. One of the privileges of being a preacher and having three kids that are about you know, six and under is it's just endless preaching material. So if you guys are tired of hearing, hearing illustrations about our kids, then just come back in about 10 years and maybe we'll, we'll give you some new material. But my son, Brave, when was it? When we were, uh, it was in June when we were in Maryland for my sister's wedding. My wife and I, we, we went to my sister's wedding in Maryland back in June and we got this like hotel suite um, with two rooms because we had three kids and we're like, we need some sleep. So y'all in that room, us in this room. And me and my wife are watching a movie on my uh, laptop. We're watching Netflix. And it's probably like 1030 at night. This is, and just to give you a picture about who my son is, my son Brave. Brave, if you're watching this 10 years later, you're probably not. But if you are, I love you. And so uh, don't stone me when you watch this. But he is, I call him like the righteous kid. Because any, any firstborns in here? Anyone understand? Okay, you understand as a firstborn, like you, t- you take guilt way more seriously, you, you just take responsibility way more seriously, and my son Brave lives this to a T. And so sometimes at night, he'll literally like go to bed like, and, and just kind of be riled up emotionally about something, and, and his conscience will haunt him to such a degree that he has to come out of bed and he has to confess to us something that happened that, that day. Maybe he picked on his sister or maybe he did something he wasn't supposed to. But he, he cannot get a good night of sleep if his conscience is haunting him. It's pretty sweet, but it's also kind of funny because this is what happened when we were uh, in Maryland for this wedding. So my wife and I are watching this movie. He's already kind of got this, this, this uh, disposition. And we just hear this the door to our room opened, and I was like, oh. Just honestly, like as a parent, you're just like, okay, what is it now? Because you, you already go through like the, the hour-long routine of getting your kids in bed. You get them their water bottles. You kiss them goodnight, and then you come back because you forgot to like do the affirmations or whatever it is, right? And so Brave creaks the door open, and he's standing there at our door. Mom, Dad. And I'm just like, oh, God. I cannot wait to hear what's going on. <laughs> so I'm lying in bed, and we're like, what's up, buddy? And he says, you know, oh, by the way, he loves his Switch. Any, any uh, Nintendo Switch people here? All right, we got, like, literally no one. Okay, so he's, he's like, we just got him a Nintendo Switch. Like, that's his thing. He wants to play it all the time. He always wants to be Mario. He wants to be Link for Hallelujah Night, all that sort of stuff. So he comes in, he says, you know how Bob told me after I finished my Switch time, that I couldn't look at another screen. <laughs> and uh, we're like, yeah. And this was like, he's talking about something that was like weeks ago. Like it wasn't even, it wasn't even recent. And so he like, we're like, yes. Or Joy's like, do you remember? She's like, yeah, I kind of remember. And then he's like, he just starts making his way over. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh no, I can't laugh. I can't laugh. I can't laugh. <laughs> And then he leans over to my wife's ear and does this. Well, when I was at the gym, someone was playing a switch, and I did. <laughs> I put the covers over my head because I was burst out laughing. And I didn't want him to see that. But uh, <laughs> I, said, uh, I said, Brave, do you need to confess your sin to Jesus? And he said, so we prayed, and he confessed, and he was, his heart was cleansed, and he went back to bed, and he had a good night's sleep. <laughs> super cute, super cute, super innocent. But what's so interesting about that situation is, like, it's such a picture of how a lot of us actually live our lives. And it might not be your switch, and it might not be screen time, but let me ask you, Have you ever experienced the peace of God departing from you? Maybe some of you in your hearts right now, you recognize 
yeah, I love God, I, I, I worship God, I acknowledge, how about this, I acknowledge that he is God. But if I'm completely honest, my life is not marked by the peace of God right now. If someone were to ask me, how are you doing in your life right now? How, how's your soul? Have, have you ever asked anyone that? You're like, no, I've never asked anyone that. I started asking people that because when I ask you, how are you? They just kind of give me the, I'm good, I'm fine. And then as soon as you say, well, how's your soul? They're like, <laughs> what? But it's like the genuine question is, like, how are you really doing? How's your soul? And if you can't say in this, it's like the first word that doesn't come to your mind is the peace of God is ruling in my heart. The peace of God is ruling in my life. Hey, I'm not here to, I'm not gonna shame you, but what I do wanna tell you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, come on somebody, if the Prince of Peace lives inside of you as a believer, and if you and I can't answer with how are we doing, peace is ruling in our lives, something is terribly wrong. Because peace is your portion, believer. Peace is your inheritance, believer, Christian, son or daughter of the Most High King. Peace is not a privilege reserved for a few. Peace is a promise from God for his kids. And it is, it is necessary that we as believers create an atmosphere in our hearts for peace to dwell and to rule. It's necessary. It's not just necessary for my benefit and for your benefit. It's necessary for the world. When, when Pastor Mike was talking about Israel, I, like something in me just broke because I was seeing it all yesterday. I was, I, was, I was on X or Twitter or whatever it is now, and I was seeing all of these horrific things happening, happening in Israel And it's like, man, like, I, don't, I don't really know the nuances of, of the geopolitical circumstance and who did what first, and there's always two sides to every story and, and all this sort of stuff, and I'm just like, man, I don't care about being politically right. All I know is the world needs the Prince of Peace like never before. And yes, we're gonna pray. We're gonna ask God to come. We're gonna ask Jesus, Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come and fix all of this in the world. But until he comes, I'm the answer. You're the answer. We are the answer. Because the Prince of Peace took a position in our hearts when we gave our lives to him. And he's saying, I want you to be an ambassador of this peace. I want you to be an ambassador of my kingdom, which is peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. And if my life personally isn't marked by peace, something is terribly wrong, and I am robbing the world of a gift that Jesus wants to give the world through me. If you're not walking in peace right now, this isn't a message to shame you, but it is a cry for help. It is, a, it is, it is an SOS beacon that you, you and I recognize that if we are not walking in the perfect peace of God, something needs to drastically change. Because it's not about you and me. And as we read Ezekiel chapter eight, we're gonna get an idea of what are the things that can rob us of this peace. Let me tell you, I'll just, I'll just give you a picture of what's, what's gonna happen. Philippians chapter four, verses six through seven. It might be on the screen. If not, I want you just to write it down. It is on the screen. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. Josh Furlong, Come coming in clutch. My dog. I gave him that verse like literally 20 seconds ago, and he put it up on the screen. So bless you, man. Thank you for your service unto the king. It says in Philippians chapter four, verses six through seven, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about what? I want you to circle that in your Bible, okay? Anything, the Greek for, for anything, you know what it is? It means anything, okay? So don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's what? Peace which exceeds anything we can understand. The peace of God that literally bypasses our intellect, goes right into our soul and on in our spirit. 
You don't have to understand the peace of God to receive it. Come on, somebody. You can have everything in your life look like it's in disarray, look like it's in chaos. None of your ducks are in a row. You don't even have ducks. You don't have any ducks. And the peace of God can still fill your heart, and you don't need to have a reason why, except that Jesus is Lord, and he sits on the throne of your heart. And that's it. That's all you and I need for us to rationalize the peace of God that is readily available for you and for me and for everyone online. If I'm preaching online, put a fire emoji in the chat right now. This is what it says. It says, his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Other translations say that let the peace of God rule. Like, take umpire, take dominion in your heart. Let the peace of God sit on the throne of your heart. And the only reason why it doesn't is because something else is sitting there. And that's what Ezekiel's gonna show us today. He's gonna show us that whether we recognize it or not, oftentimes there is a constant war. There is a constant war. It's like, uh, what's that game? Musical chairs. Everyone ever play musical chairs? Everyone ever got like in a fist fight over musical chairs? Because there's one chair left and you're like, blah, blah, blah. And Kyle's probably won a few of those. But it's like, it's, it's, imagine that picture. There's a fight to get into the seat, the throne of your heart, and the enemy is not going to go out without kicking and screaming, without a fight to get back on the throne of your heart and my heart. This is what it says in 1 John chapter 5, 21. It says, dear children, keep away from anything that might take away, that might take God's place in your hearts. Someone say idolatry. idolatry. This is what idolatry is. Plain and simple. It's allowing anything other than the creator to take the throne of our hearts. How do we deal with this? We're gonna, we're gonna learn from Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter eight, verses one through six. I'm just gonna read. It says, then on September 17th, during the sixth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, while the leaders of Judah were in my home, the sovereign Lord took hold of me. So whenever, I was thinking like, dude, can you imagine, have you ever had dinner with somebody and they were just like spacing out and they were just like, like in another dimension? That's basically what's happening to him right now. He's like in this, he's hanging out with these people and then he just enters a whole other dimension. And it says that he saw a figure that appeared to be a man from what appeared to be his waist down. He looked like a burning flame. From the waist up, he looked like gleaming amber. Some people say that this is a Christophany. This is a picture of Christ coming in the Old Testament and having an encounter with Ezekiel. It says, he reached out what seemed to be a hand and took me by the hair. Ouch. Then the Spirit lifted me up into the sky and transported me to Jerusalem in a vision from God. I was taken to the north gate of the inner courtyard of the temple where there is a large idol. I want you to circle large idol in your Bible, circle large idol, that has made the Lord very jealous. Suddenly the glory of the, of the God of Israel was there, just as I had seen it before in the valley. Then the Lord said to me, son of man, look toward the north. So I looked, and there to the north, beside the entrance to the gate near the altar, stood the idol that made the Lord so jealous. Son of man, he said, do you see what they are doing? Do you see the detestable sins the people of Israel are committing to drive me? Someone say, drive me. I want you to underline that. Drive me from my temple. But come, and you will see even more detestable sins than these. Pause right there. First point I want you to write out is driven out. Driven out. The only reason why we lack the peace of God in our lives is because the manifest presence of God has been driven out. It's not because God is playing hard to get. It's not because God plays games. God does not play games. God is not a manipulator. He's not inviting you into an abusive relationship. The only reason why we don't experience the manifest presence of God in our lives is because we invite something else in that drives him out. We're reading about God being a jealous God, and some of us here, even right now, as we're reading that, it, it's, uh, it rubs us the wrong way. Because I've seen it in culture, I've seen it commented on my videos, 
People say, well, if God is so supreme and he's so sufficient and he doesn't need anything, why is he jealous of me? Sounds like a pretty insecure God, right? God is not jealous of anyone. He doesn't need anything from you. He doesn't need anything from me. He's way cooler than us. He's way smarter than us. He's way more beautiful than all of us. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He created something. He created everything out of nothing. He doesn't need us. God is not jealous of you. He's jealous for you. And here's the difference. If I'm not jealous for my wife, I don't really love her. Because if another guy tried to sweep her off her feet and take her away, if that doesn't, if, that, if something in me doesn't rise off to want to take off this dude's head, do I really love her? God is not jealous of you. He's jealous for you. He created you and he pre-programmed you and pre-programmed me with one purpose and it's to worship him. And we will worship something. We always will. But our worship is constantly drifting from one thing to the next, from one empty promise to the next. And Jesus is saying, only one will satisfy. You were pre-programmed to worship the one who created you, the author of life, the one from whom every blessing flows. This is why it says in, in Exodus, it says, Exodus chapter 20, the first two commandments, the first two of the Ten Commandments, it says, and God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the first one. You shall have no other gods before me. What does that mean? Above me? No, what, what God is saying right there is you and I were created to have face time with him. Like when I hold my daughter Raven and I look her in the eyes, I want her to be so focused on me that she doesn't see anything else in the world. She doesn't think about her pain. She doesn't think about how she was made fun of. She doesn't think about any of that sort of stuff. She's looking at me because when she looks at me, I'm convinced that, she, that, that these eyes, these eyes will convince her of her value if she just wouldn't look away. And so when I look into my daughter's eyes, I don't want anything obstructing that connection. That's what God means when he says, I don't want you to have any other gods before me. Wow. Nothing should obstruct this view because I'm jealous for you. I want you. I want to know you. I want you to be known by me. Every good gift that you could possibly imagine and chase after is actually found in me perfectly. Don't let any of those things get in the way between us. Verse five, it says, you shall not bow down. Oh, excuse me. It says, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything. This is the second commandment. Don't make a graven image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for their sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. I'm just, I'm just recognizing this right now as I read this. We gotta understand that God is a just God. Someone say it, God is just. God is, just. God is, righteous. God is righteous. God does not apologize for being just and being righteous. And I think so often because we care about people and it could come from a, from a well-meaning place, we want to apologize for things that God doesn't apologize about. God does not apologize about punishing sin. And so when you look at God, you look at God through this, this text, you might think, oh my gosh, this sounds like a really angry God. But did you just catch the pattern here? He says that he will, not, he will punish the children for the sin of the parents, meaning sin has consequences. Sin has generational consequences. But he'll only visit it from the third to the fourth generation. Whereas obedience gives a blessing for thousands of generations. Come on, somebody. God is not looking to strike you down. He is looking for an opportunity to bless you and to bless you undeservedly. Yes. Yes. This is who he is, yet he is just. He is also merciful and gracious. 
But if we allow anything to come before us in this amazing God, we're stifling the Holy Spirit. That's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Quenching the Holy Spirit. We are driving out the manifest presence of God. Now, you might be thinking, Cap, but I thought God was omnipresent. I thought God's always present. And you're right, God is always present. But there's a difference between between having God be present in your life and having God be powerful in your life and having God be personal in your life. They're completely different things. I can be present in a relationship with my wife. We can live in the same house but not be on the same page. We can be roommates but not lovers. And so God might be present in our lives, but unless we can recognize, no, God is moving, he is powerful, he is personal, he is speaking, he is keeping me in his perfect peace, he is providing, I see him in every detail in my lives. If we, in my life, if we cannot say that honestly, then we just have room to grow. We got room to grow in acknowledging and experiencing the manifest presence of God, and God is not playing games. Someone needs to write that in their journal right now. God is not playing games with you. I know I'm speaking to some people in the house of God or online right now. You've been hoping that God would speak to you. You've been waiting for God to speak to you. You've been waiting for God to show up. And if you're honest, you feel like God is more distant than ever. Let me tell you, and this is good news. I'm not saying this to shame you. The problem is not God. That's good news. Because if it's not God, that means that I can fix the problem. If it has something to do with me and where my focus is and what's standing in between me and God, maybe it's an expectation, maybe it's looking for a new job, looking for a spouse, maybe it's my kids, maybe it's my health, I can't tell you what it is. Holy Spirit will reveal it to you today. But if there's anything that dominates our thoughts that keeps us from connecting with God, we get to be a part of the solution. And it's curable. Someone say it's curable. This is good news for us today. Some of us think that God is only jealous about the big idols. That's why I wanted you to circle that thing about the large idol. You're thinking, well, I don't really have big idols in my life. I don't have like a giant like talisman as you walk. Some of you do, and you might need to get rid of those. But if you don't have a giant talisman in your house, let me tell you, what what does God say at the end of this? He says, this is really interesting. At the end of this verse in Ezekiel chapter eight, verse six, it says, son of man, he said, do you see what they are doing? Do you see the detestable sins of the people of Israel are committing to drive me from my temple? But come, you will see even more detestable sins than these. Let me tell you, sometimes the most grievous idols in our lives are not the big ones, but they're the small ones. They're the hidden ones. This is where God calls us to dig deeper. Someone say dig deeper. This is what it says in Ezekiel chapter eight. You can write dig deep. That's our second point. Ezekiel chapter eight, verses seven through 13. It says, then he brought me to the door of the temple courtyard where I could see a hole in the wall. He said to me, now son of man, dig into the wall. I want you to circle dig. So I dug into the wall and found a hidden doorway. Go in, he said, and see the wicked and detestable things or sins they are committing in there. So I went in and saw the walls covered with engravings of all kinds of crawling things and detestable creatures. Just disgusting stuff. I also saw the various idols worshipped by the people of Israel. Seventy leaders of Israel were standing there with uh, Jaazaniah, son of Shaphan. Sorry, guys. uh, Hebrew is not my first language. In the center. Each of them held an incense burner from which a cloud of incense rose above their heads. Then the Lord said to me, son of man, have you seen what the leaders of Israel are doing with their idols in dark rooms? They are saying, (laughs) oh, this will hit us. They're saying the Lord doesn't see us. He has deserted our land. Then the Lord added, come and I will show you even more detestable sins than these. I think the reason why that stuck out to me was because when when we get comfortable and, and when we become familiar without having the peace of God leading us in our lives and helping us make every decision, we can begin to believe the lie that God doesn't see any of it. And it can take us into deeper places in sin, really drifting from him than we would ever imagine ourselves being. But I want you to go back to this word hole. The hole in the wall is not like a little bar or restaurant on the side of the street. What is the hole? It's like literally a hole. 
I want you to imagine if you're walking through here and you saw like a little tiny hole. Imagine a hole like this big, just in the wall right there. Really easy to not notice, but if you're familiar, if you're paying attention, you'd say, that something doesn't, this sticks out, this doesn't belong here. I want you to ask yourself right now, you can journal this, what's the hole in the wall in your life that is easy to not pay attention to? Let me go deeper. Denise, Pastor Todd's wife, uses the term tip-off. I love that term because I think that, that's a great way of helping us frame what, what is the hole in the wall that is so easy for me to not pay attention to? I wrote down some of them. Some of them are personal. Some of them might be personal to you. What are the tip-offs in your life or my life? Not sleeping well. The Bible says that God gives his beloved rest. So if all of a sudden you're not sleeping well, if you, if you have a history of sleeping really well, and then all of a sudden you stop sleeping really well, don't just accept it as your fate. It could be a hole in the wall that God wants you to dig deeper into. Distraction during worship. Maybe you're someone like, you love worshiping God, you love praising God, but if you're completely honest recently, as you're worshiping God, you're thinking about work all of a sudden, you're thinking about a certain relationship all of a sudden, you're thinking about your finances all of a sudden, something is distracting you from worship. It's coming in between, it's coming before you and God. What's the hole in the wall? What's the hole in the wall for you? I'm gonna read off some other ones. I want you to internalize this and journal whatever one might fit you in your season. Becoming suddenly physically unwell, chronically in bizarre ways, and you can't figure out where it's coming from or how to resolve it. Financial friction. All of a sudden, your finances are looking funny. You're like, I don't really know what's going on here. Might be a hole in the wall. You begin overworking, staying up later, working weekends, overeating. You start communicating more with more of an edge more of a short tone, more sarcastically, and that's not you. Why is this happening? Sometimes we can just go through the motions and we don't acknowledge, like, well, I'm not like this. This isn't my personality. This isn't how God created me. Why is this coming out of my heart? Because there's something deeper that God wants us to dig into. Becoming envious, covetous, inability to celebrate others. Someone else gets a promotion, someone else God blesses, and all of a sudden you just, in your mind, you're tearing them down and thinking of all the reasons why they don't deserve it rather than celebrating them. Becoming cynical, judgmental, overly anxious, fearful, like illogically fearful, impatient, lethargic, lazy, hopeless, reserved and quiet and overly timid, or domineering, bitter or offended. The list goes on. Let the Holy Spirit ask you, how are you acting out of character right now? Where is the blemish in your wall? Let's dig deeper. So here's what the Holy Spirit does. Here's what's amazing. God does not send us out and say, go and figure this out on your own. If God's not bringing up anything to mind, then don't dig. Sometimes I think we can get so caught up in self-condemnation where it's like, oh my God, I want to please God, and there's got to be something wrong. There's got to be something wrong with me. And maybe God's like, yeah, I mean, I'm going to work you through a process, but I'm not highlighting anything for you right now. Yeah. You don't need to do the digging in a place that God doesn't tell you to dig. In fact, if you do, it can actually lead to guilt, shame, and condemnation. Wow. Holy Spirit will not send you out to go dig on your own. He will lead you and invite you to dig up in your heart. He's gonna dig, he's gonna ask you questions. Why'd you respond that way to your wife? Why'd you respond that way to your kids? How come when, when your friends do this or they don't invite you to this, like you all of a sudden, like you explode with emotion? Whatever it is, I don't know what the answer is to you. Maybe you get a text from your boss on the weekend and all of a sudden, boom, like your whole world goes into a frenzy. What's, what's going on there? It's a hole in the wall that the Holy Spirit is inviting you to dig so you can get to the root which is likely an idol. As you see what happens when Ezekiel is digging into the wall, it uncovers this room filled with idols, filled with every creeping thing, like a disgusting scene. One of the things I hate about summer, I love summer. I, I already miss summer. Summer, where'd you go? Come back. Winter is like right around the corner, and then it's like literally 13 months of winter, like more months than there are in the year, and then summer will come back another day. But when summer comes back, you know what also comes back? Maggots in my trash can. I figured out how to stop it. 
You wanna know how to stop it? So you don't just tie, this is a total tangent, but you don't just tie like a normal knot. You have to like take the orange like bunny ears of your trash bag and you gotta tie, like you gotta strangle the neck of your garbage, can, or garbage bag so that nothing can come in or come out. Just, just do that. I'm telling you, it changed everything. So now we don't deal with the maggots anymore. But for so long, the point of that was for so long, anytime I opened up the trash can in the summer, I was like, Ugh! I was like, all these maggots everywhere is just horrible. Because we would tie our trash bags, but flies are sneaky. They figured their way in. And Anyway, the point was, the point was, horrific scene. Horrific scene of every creepy, crawly thing you can imagine in those trash cans. <laughs> Guys, let me preach. I'm gonna get to it. I'm gonna get to the point. Guys, making me laugh. Okay, wow, really? <laughs> it's just like still going for it. All right, reel us back in. The temple. All of this is taking place in the temple. What's the new temple? Our body is the new temple of the Holy Spirit. So that trash can is actually a picture of my heart when I give my heart over to idols. It's a picture of the demonic influences that I'm inviting into my life. Literal demonic influences. You can write this down in your notes. There's no such thing as an idol, idol. I-D-L-E space, I-D-O-L. There's no such thing as an idol, idol, because I think so often what we can say is, it's not a big deal, or it's my job. What do you want me to do, quit my job? Or it's my spouse. What do you want me to do, get a divorce with my spouse? We'll get deeper into how do we deal with these things, but what we have to recognize is when we hold anything in the, on the throne of our hearts above Jesus Christ, all of a sudden we lose access to the promise of the peace of God guarding our hearts, and we open up a door to all sorts of chaos into our lives. We open the door to everything I just read on that list, every creepy, crawling thing that defiles us and defiles the world around us but it's curable. Someone say it's curable. This is a message of hope, but we gotta ask ourselves, am I willing to go deep with the Holy Spirit? Am I willing to dig deep into those holes? I want you to write this down. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, you say I am allowed to do anything, okay? We as Christians, we, we have the freedom. This is what's amazing. Jesus paid a high price on the cross for you and for me so that we do not enter his courts through our own good works. We do not enter a relationship with God by being good people. Someone needs to hear that today. You've been coming to church for a long time and God bless you, that just has kept going over your head. Today, let it go just right in the middle of your head and your heart. This is the most important thing you can ever get out of this message today. You and I will not enter a relationship with God by being good people. We enter a relationship with God because though we were sinners who fell short of the glory of God, he who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is great news. What this means is the game is rigged in your favor, Christian. You are already accepted. You are already beloved. You are already cleansed. You are already holy. You are already purified because of what Jesus did for you and for me. It's amazing. The game is rigged in our favor. We're free. But freedom is not a license to sin. It says, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. I want you to write down this final point, drastic change. If we want to see the peace of God restored in our lives. We got to expose these dirty little secrets and we got to say, God, what's the drastic change you'd like for me to make? Ezekiel chapter 11, we're gonna skip ahead a couple of chapters. This is what it says in verse 14. Then this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, the people still left in Jerusalem are talking about you and your relatives and all the people of Israel who are in exile. They are saying those people are 
far away from the Lord, so now he has given their land to us. Therefore, tell the exiles, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Although I have scattered you in the countries of the world, I will be your sanctuary. I will be a sanctuary to you during your time in exile. I, the sovereign Lord, will gather you back from the nations where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel once again. Check this out, verse 18. I want you to underline this, bold this, star this, put a heart around it. When the people return to their homeland, they will remove every trace of their vile images and detestable idols. Return and remove. Let me tell you, God is not in the business of driving you away from himself. He's trying to draw you close, but he's asking you and me to return to him. And here's what I wanna tell you. Here's the simplest way that we can make drastic change, the drastic change that Jesus wants us to make so we can enter back into his courts with praise and thanksgiving and experience the peace and power of God. Let's go back to Philippians chapter four. I want you to read this again. Understand this about our good and gracious God. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Guys, I know for some people, as we talk about these things, these, these idols and things like that, some of you already know, man, God, there's some gross stuff in my life that I gotta put on the altar. Praise God, give it to him, let him deal with it. But then there's other people, it could be a good thing. Your marriage could be a good thing. Your, your relationship with your children could be a good thing. Your health could be a good thing. Your job can be a good thing. Your finances is a good thing. But when we take these things and we become mastered by these things and these things no longer serve us as we serve Christ, then we got a big problem. And the solution is so simple, guys. I know there's so many people, there's people in this room right now, financial disarray. You've been trying to figure out how to fix your financial situation on your own because you think it's from God. You think that your financial disarray is because God has left you. No, there's something there that drove him out. His manifest presence, the power of God, it drove him out, but he doesn't want to be outside of your circumstance. For some of you, you're thinking, what, why can't, why can't my spouse understand me? Why can't they speak my love language? Or why can't my wife respect me? And you're trying to do it a worldly way and you're wondering why there's more confusion, more destruction, more disarray. Some of you have been chronically ill and you've been trying to figure out how to get whole without encountering Jehovah Rapha, your healer, and inviting him into the process. Some of you, and this isn't to shame anyone, guys, because I've lived here before too. I walked through it tremendously last year, and God had to get my attention. There's some people in here who've had a barren womb for a long time, and you think God has abandoned you, and the temptation is to go figure, out, figure it out outside of God because he's the one who gave you this affliction. That's exactly what the enemy wants us to do. All you gotta do, all you and I gotta do, is return, return, and say, God, I made an idol out of this thing. I took a good thing and I put it in a place that it never had the power or authority to be. And God, I just remove that from the throne of my heart and I just invite you into this. Watching online right now, Some, there's someone watching right now, you have a prodigal son or daughter who's ran away from home spiritually. You have no relationship with them anymore. And you've, the temptation has been for you to go away from church, to get away from God, because you felt like God is the one who did this. I see for some of you right now, even watching online, your child specifically ran away from God because they're struggling with their sexual identity. And they felt, they felt like there was no place for them in church. There was no acceptance. There's no family for them in church. So they ran away from God. They begged God to take it away from them. And then here you are saying, God, if you really love my kid, why would you drive them away from your presence? And you're trying to figure out how to fix that relationship with your child all on your own. Let me tell you, Jesus is the minister of reconciliation. You can't get it without him. And everything can turn around today if you invite God into the circumstance. Anything, everything can turn around for you today. If you say, God, how do I handle my financial situation? How do you want me to steward your finances? How do you want me to steward my, your health with the body that you've given me, God? I invite you, 
Lord. And what happens? Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I wanna invite you to stand to your feet as we close. I want you just to do business with God in a moment right now. If you're in that place where you recognize that something has stood in between you and God, I want you to close your eyes. I just want you to confess it to him. Bring it to him and say, God, I'm sorry for making this a supreme thing in my life. I renounce my worship of this thing. I renounce all agreements that this thing is my Lord, this thing is my master, this thing will bring me peace, this thing will bring me fulfillment. Today, God, I remove it from the throne of my heart. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to to take up residence in my heart. May your peace rule in me today. That thing will serve me as I serve you. I will not serve that thing any longer. I will not serve it any longer, Lord. I serve you. I serve no one else. You are a good master. You take care of your servants. You take care of your children. And God, I receive the perfect, the perfect peace of God that surpasses understanding right now in the name of Jesus. If you receive it, say, I receive it in Jesus' name. I want to give a final opportunity.